Hey, welcome back, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us again. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, you have come at an opportune time, and we're so excited to have you all here. We have some more art shares that we're going to be uh, presenting today from some amazing and incredible artists. Uh, we have um, Ore Olua Badaki, who will be presenting Seed and Sound. And after that, we will be having Iche present Chiwi Home. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Yo. Oh my gosh. Hi, everybody. Um, Deborah here. We are, and I'm in conversation with Yo Ornelas. Thank you so much. Um, after we have our two art chairs, then we're going to hit our final panel of the day, which is Indigenous Digital with Canyon Sears Roots, Ieche, and in conversation with our own Nikki Martinez. So stay tuned for that short hour long session that will follow these two art chairs. And of course the micro turgs that are at the end of each of the art chairs. We're so excited, but there's more after that. We've got more art chairs throughout the day until two o'clock. So stay with us friends. Now let's get into some art chairs.
Hi, everybody. This is amazing. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. This is going to be the Indigenous Digital Contemporary Native Storytelling. Um, hi, I'm Nikki Martinez. If uh, you all were here early in the morning for the TAC conference, I was there. Um, but now I'm going to be moderating this talk. Um, and uh, I just wanted to drop in the chat um, a resource so you could look up which native lands that you're zooming in from. Um, and from intros, I'm going to introduce these amazing people that I'm going to be talking to with today. Um, but I'm going to model the introduction. So hi, my name is Nikki Martinez. My pronouns go by they, them. Um, 
I am zooming in from Milwaukee territory, also known as San Jose, and uh, I am a local Bay Area artist. Uh, I do mainly writing and performing arts, but I'm also known to do some devising theater with Fool's Fury. Um, and now I want to have Canyon introduce themselves and then I'll go to HA. Mishmin Tuhis, Conrakot Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sarah's Roots. I identify as Mutsun Ohlone and Chumash and Euromut ancestry. And I currently am um, phoning in from Tamian Ohlone territory. Uh, active communities here are Tamian Nation and the Mowekma Band, uh, AKA Santa Clara County. And so I am honored to be here and I have so many things to say and I'm going to keep it simple and I'm honored to share perspective in this circle. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, Shibu, I'm Ia Chit and I go by Faye Fair pronouns. Currently I'm in Ramatush Ohlone land. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to share space with y'all. Thank you so much. And if everybody in the chat could put, please drop down in the chat where you're zooming in from so we all know which territories you're in. Um, I think that's always fun and exciting to interact with um, during our chat. But let's get into this conversation. Um, and since we're talking about the internet, I first want to start off with uh, what does decolonizing the internet mean to you? And any of you could just jump in and answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pipe in. I might have more to say later because I never know what to say. When I think of decolonization, I think of questioning how we got to where we are. And to decolonize is to break apart what uh, or break down what we consider colonization. And we would then have to know truth and history about what colonization is. And that comes in the format of unsettling and decolonizing. And then I try and also bring in the reimagining and re reindigenization. So uh, when I think of decolonizing the internet, one, what does it do? Why is it here? How does it function? And then what elements have been informed? Um, what was created and how was it informed? Uh, I'll use one example. I point out to people that Wikipedia is racist and they go, why? It's sourced by the community. And I'm like, well, think about settler colonial history, settler colonial academia. It validates written narratives where it validates history only in the written format because uh, let's say archeology, span my ancestors are called prehistoric. Prehistoric ancestral remains. But when we hear the word, we think of dinosaurs because of our education system. So when I think, when I point out that I believe that Wikipedia is racist is because it does not allow us to cite our oral narratives. It does not allow us to cite the indigenous history that has been present and prevalent for thousands and thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial. That being said, I understand why it's hard for them not to do so, i.e. trolls will be trolls and people citing sources, but why is it that I can't cite the ancestral wisdom of my ancestors as a citable source, but then someone could misquote me, poorly type my name, misspell it, but because they're in an, a journal, they get to be cited as a citable source and have it verified and validated. So to me, decolonizing the internet is questioning, is breaking down and, and considering the parameters of which it was created. And let's think about it. I currently reside in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. And many of these organizations don't honor indigenous protocol. They don't honor or acknowledge the history of the land that they are on. And quite simply putting it, if you do not know the history of the land that you are on, but you claim you want to educate the public, you claim you care about the environment going forward, you care about development, you care about the education of young beings, you care about climate change, and you don't know the history of the land that you're on, you're coming to the table underinformed. And when you're coming to the table underinformed, are you really, is the conclusions you're coming to actually going to be viable and reasonable? So that's my small little tidbit there. I might have more, but uh, I'll save some of the juicy stuff. <laughs> I'm really glad you said, you mentioned Wikipedia. 
I am Luisca, um, which I hate saying Colombia because it's literally named after Columbus, um, but that's where I'm from. And if you look up Muisca or Muscubu in my native tongue, Wikipedia says it's a dead language. Um, and that's BS because no language is dead. Every language has a spirit. And so I agree with everything you said, thank you. Um, for me, de decolonizing the internet, I recently um, dove into digital drag and being disabled, I always felt like I wasn't enough to be like an actual performer. And I think I never really saw representation of like other two-spirit folks, especially in the Bay Area. It can be very whitewashed um, and discouraging. But with digital drag, I felt like accepted and I was able to take up space and it's all new to me, um, but it's very empowering. And I think that's one way I'm decolonizing is taking up space digitally because I couldn't do that in real life. I actually, for the first time, did my real life drag performance last night. And I'm not gonna lie, it was, it was kind of discouraging. It wasn't accessible. It was very white. Um, I was the only performer who acknowledged the land I was on. And it's, it's sad that it's not a commonplace thing to do. <laughs> you would think, but I guess it's not very common. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think being indigenous, being disabled, um, being queer and just existing is almost radical and decolonizing in itself, right? Um, I actually have a tattoo on me that says existing is resisting for that reminder. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of my thoughts on that question. Thank you. And, you know, Kenyon, if you want to answer this question, because EHA, you sort of answered this question already of like what strategies you use to resist colonization on the internet. Um, like what are some of your tools or what makes you uh, feel like you're really uh, resisting and deconstructing this idea of colonization on the internet? Uh, to segue the add on to the previous question as um, a little closing, I also wanna point out that Western settler colonialism has informed us about our decision-making and protocols going forward. We're entitled to property, we're entitled to capitalizing off of opportunity. And so like the stereotypical, we have the oogle, oogle energy of um, monopolizing the internet and we just say, hey, how do I change a tire? Hey, how do I do this? And it's great because I don't even want to say it because it might trigger my device to do the, do the action. Hey, Google. And so um, if I say, how do I change a tire? That's great, great information, instant gratification. I need it now, give it to me. But how would you feel? Well, well I can't even say how would you, well, our community here is uh, a little more considerate of cultural competent approaches and cultural sensitive elements like, hi, indigenous person, can you tell me your coming of age ceremony for your young women? Instant gratification, gimme, gimme, gimme. That's really demanding. And that's not part of our cultural protocols of just interfacing and interacting. So that kind of entitlement, I really want to indigenize the internet by putting a flow chart of you have to do some work to show up in community to get more access to further. So instead of just saying immediately, how do I do this? It's like, what do I do or how do I navigate this? And then you get there, you interface with a flow chart where it says, if this, then that, then you interface. And then you get a little, if you, mm, I'll go with, uh, um, later on, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. Um, personally, uh, what I do, well, uh, I attempt to honor native land wherever I go. So land acknowledgements. I'm hyper tokenized for that reason as well, because I live in the Bay Area and I trace my ancestry to the Bay Area of Central Coastal California in contemporarily known Ohlone territory, given that that is a misnomer. My ancestors did not know that word. Um, I have fun with uh, opportunities of educating. This is hashtag roaming Ohlone, and he is an accurately depicted native figurine in regalia because indigenous peoples, we don't wear costumes. And wherever he goes, he takes selfies with people. He's met Wayne Leduc. He's met Dallas Goldtooth in the 1491s, uh, uh, Tom Goldtooth of uh, environment, Indigenous Environmental Network, um, amazing beings, and also works with language because as mentioned, languages aren't dead. 
There are many that might be dormant, but language and verbiage matters. Representation matters. So one, he's a little figurine from the Powhatan mold, but think about it. We have these little army guys. We can name a gunny, we can name a sniper, we can name a medic, we can name infantry. We can name their job titles in their little depictions, but what type of representation do indigenous peoples have? And they're usually pan-Indian. And ask yourself, do you think indigenous peoples were ever consulted about how their likeness was depicted on media? Probably not, or not many, or the, at least the story hasn't been acknowledged properly. And so if you follow Roaming Ohlone, my business name is Canyon Consulting and he has his own little page. And uh, he's on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, and he acknowledges native land wherever he goes, attempting to learn about the native peoples, sometimes working with language, sometimes working with community, but just roams around and it was really, really fun. And um, the goal is also to be international. So to learn about indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, that's one method. Um, as a queer two-spirit community member, I failed to mention my pronouns because I'm ambiguous. I'm okay with she, they, coyote. Um, I voice opportunities of representation. I am non-diagnosed through Western uh, medical industry uh, in regards to how I identify as neurodivergent. I know I have ADHD, I am dyslexic, I struggle with some patterns of OCD and claustrophobia too. Um, but there, with this, many times we see these things as Western science depicts these as potential diseases, problems, hindrances, um, lack of ability. And to me, I, I recognize that these help me navigate the world differently. And to me, diverse perspectives are necessary. The same way culture sharing is necessary. And culture sharing helps us understand that there are not, there isn't a singular truth. There are many perspectives and many truths. And, and instead of saying my way is the only way, this is the way to learn. This is the way to work. This is the way to do this task. There's many ways to see things. And so representation matters. So wherever I go, I attempt to acknowledge indigenous protocol by sharing and communicating the importance of recognizing the indigenous peoples of whose land we are on. I also attempt to engage in more culturally sensitive and culturally competent approaches. Uh, one example would be, uh, as an artist, I was commissioned to create a bas relief um, uh, for, a, for our ancestors that were reinterred in an area where a project disrupted them. My mother and my grandmother believe that when an individual is on earth, the spirit of that individual is wandering. And that being said, I was commissioned to create a bas relief as an honor mural, and it was not in my homeland, my territory. So I created an art piece with a howling coyote, and then I used my language, the Mutsun language, to offer a prayer. And I wrote it into the bas relief, and I said, this needs to be two pieces. They really wanted it to be one piece. As a tribute, I said, this is the Mutsun language. This is not the original language of this land. This is an artistic piece to honor the original languages of the Bay Area. However, if the native peoples of this land want to have a prayer or a plaque or an acknowledgement, my piece needs to have the opportunity to be removed in case that ever wants to happen. It is only the most culturally sensitive a way to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the land to not misrepresent myself or the people of the land. I could do so as an artist by sharing my perspective and my language. However, if the native peoples want to offer a prayer, they have full right to remove it and add theirs in the future. Um, highly doubtful, but for that approach and that consideration is necessary. And I attempt to bring that perspective. I'm a consultant, so I consult. I love media. So I love to interface with various forms of media from uh, offering land acknowledgements for the Alphabet Rockers, um, a youth, uh, youth music group um, of, the East, of the East Bay um, in Chichenyo Ohlone territory in Huchin. And so that uh, I offer my voice uh, in this format of vocals and song. Um, so on the internet, I just try and offer truth and history and perspective sharing as, to the best of my ability. So YouTube videos, Instagram videos, I try and encourage people to create GIFs and language revitalization efforts. So like GIFs and um, TikToks and, uh, and like um, celebrate uh, perspective sharing. So getting clips from indigenous movies and indigenous representation. So like pointing, mm, mm, 
<laughs> or or let's go then or in it in it funny stuff like that so having fun for sharing media and perspective and representation and uh yeah <laughs> it Che, you could add on to your answer before other than like uh doing digital drag and the accessibility um but yeah, if you have any other I'm just, I'm just really happy uh, to hear, um, just to be in community right now. Um, I think I'm just still processing last night, but um, I guess one way I, I love film and like uh, Coyote said, representation is everything. And I think for a long time as a kid, I felt so discouraged. Um, that I couldn't be a director, or make art or any, or take up space, like I said, because I'm like, who can I relate to in this art world? Um, but I finally decided to take up space. I feel like the pandemic kind of pushed me to confront my fears, um, which I'm grateful for. It was scary, but I'm glad. <laughs> um, and I started doing short films and I started to sing songs of my peoples and I started to revitalize my culture and my language and translate the words to English so that I can educate folks. Whoever decides to see my videos, they can learn my language. And if they just say my name, it's keeping the language alive. And it's something that I've been teaching my nibblings actually. And it's so sweet to hear them say my name and you know, you say why yeah to, to call their mother and just to really keep it going because it's so it's so sad. I try to I'm actually teaching my parents. Um, they're so they're still learning about decolonization. I feel like the they had to conform out of survival and there's a lot of shame with their indigeneity. And it's really unfortunate because it's such a beautiful and powerful thing. And I feel like now I have the privilege to really take that back and reclaim it. And they don't, yeah, they don't know Muscaboon. I'm the one teaching them. And it's so backwards, but that's just proof of how much colonizers have taken from us. But despite that, we are still here. And that's, that's what matters and we are not going anywhere. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. I also wanted to ask just around that in regards of language and generational trauma, um, because I am first generation Salvadorian, second generation Mexican, and there's always this conflict with the Latina community claiming indigeneity because we've been such we've been separated for so long and this idea of like okay well if I want to go back into my roots like I understand that I'm Mexican and Salvadorian but looking into the indigenous cultures like I feel like I should be there but at the same time I don't want to um colonize my own people you know what I mean um and I feel like a lot of people express that especially in the Latin community and I'm just wondering just because you're from Colombia how how do you unpack that and how uh, enriching it was to sort of you know claim that indigeneity back yeah I think it was processing all that generational trauma that my parents didn't get to process, <laughs> that my older siblings didn't get to process. Um, I think I kind of just, I kind of did it for them and with them, at least with one of my siblings. Um, but yeah, there, it's complex because the two, uh, uh, my first language is Spanish, which is a colonizer language. Then I was forced to learn English, which is another colonizer language. And being trans, I went through name changes and it was like a journey. So like initially my first like name change was given by a friend and it was Quinn, which is very Anglo, very, very Caucasian. Um, and then I switched it to Mateo because my mom was like, oh, if you were born a boy, I would have called you Mateo. And it just felt right at the time. But I'm like, no, this also feels very colonizer-y. And then when I started to learn my language and starting to get access 
that um, I think it was a Virgo full moon. Ia Chia just came to me. It was very much ancestors giving me, holding me and telling me like, it's okay to, to go back to your roots. Because like I said, now I have the privilege to do that. My parents didn't. Uh, my grandparents didn't, you know, it was all survival. And for a minute, I was almost, I was almost angry with them. I'm like, why didn't you, you know, hold true to your roots? But it's like, it's more complicated. Like, I probably wouldn't have been here if, you know, they didn't adapt. Like, they crossed the border and had to learn English, had to figure it out, along with two of my siblings. So, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of trauma that I'm still processing. And I know for a fact, my parents are still processing because another thing is like mental health isn't really talked about in my culture. It's not, you know, I feel like it's very seen in white cultures, um, but it's not, it's not a privilege that we had or have, I should say. Um, I'm starting to learn as an adult that like, yeah, I have CPTSD and I'm autistic and you know, and I, yeah, I don't have the privilege to be diagnosed, but I know, like I do my research and I'm like, okay, this is very relatable. This is my experience. Um, but yeah, I didn't get to learn all these things as a kid. So now I'm just catching up <laughs> along with being trans. I'm just like, ah! um, and learning my language, right. And teaching it to my, it's just a lot, but I'm very grateful to be able to do that, you know, and I hope that my nibblings, you know, once like they meet new friends or have kids of their own, that they can pass that on. And yeah, I'm just excited to learn more about my peoples because it's very limited resources at the moment. And I think another reason I make art is to kind of just reach out to anyone else who is Muisca, who's queer, because I know there's someone there. <laughs> um, and actually one person did reach out to me on Facebook they saw my name and they were like oh my god are you Muisca and I was like is this real um and I think that was another way of ancestors kind of affirming my um connect um but yeah that's so beautiful thank you so much for sharing that um I do want to uplift a question that was asked in the chat uh this is for Ieche um, this is a question from Emily. I was curious about your parents and whether they taught you your language. Thanks for sharing the multi-direction education you're sharing. Um, I understand that like you were teaching your parents, but did in any of your research or if any of your um, history of finding, did your parents help you? No, actually it's really sad. Um, they were very like, they weren't very supportive. And I think it's out of that survival mentality. They're like, no, you need to, you need to be as, you know, white or as American, you know, as possible to be able to be successful. Right. And I think I had to process that in my head. Cause at first I was angry that they weren't supportive. They're like, why don't you, you know, become more fluent with French or Italian. And I'm just like, like it, they have a lot of decolonizing to do on their own and I'm trying to guide them because, you know, they brought me into this world and they've supported me, supported me in the way that they thought was the best way uh, to survive. And so, um, yeah, at first they weren't very about it, um, but as they saw how adamant I was, and I'm sharing more things with them. And it, it was actually really interesting because my mom was starting to kind of remember things from her childhood when I was like telling her certain stories or things that I learned. Um, she was like, actually, yeah, I do remember this. Or like, I did do ritual with my, my grandma or like certain things will pop up again. And I feel like it was all repressed, right? Because it was a sense of shame that she had. Um, but now that I'm bringing it up again, I feel like maybe it's a safe space for her to also reconnect. Um, so I'm hoping that soon she'll be able to remember some things that maybe has been bottled down um, and will help me 
have better knowledge, you know, about my history and my ancestry. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Um, before we start of dive deeper in language, um, I do want to show your video, Good Day, and I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about it before we show it, and then we'll come back and sort of talk deeper in about language um, and this sure. idea of revival. Yeah, um, so this was the first video I did of a song in my people's language. Um, it's basically, it's really beautiful. And I think it's something that we as people need to really be aware and mindful of our carbon footprint and how we just navigate the world, how we treat others, how we treat Mother Earth, how we treat the dirt beneath our feet, how, you know, everything. Um, and it's, it's not a priority for people and it's not a daily concern for people. And that scares me. <laughs> um, so yeah, this song is basically just checking in with nature um, and with mother earth. And I think it's really beautiful and grounding. So I hope uh, it brings um, the viewers joy. Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, and can we roll that video now? When we speak in Muscadu, we are speaking in our natural language. My voice shivers from the internal trauma that the Europeans created, but their invasion didn't kill us. And now my children will speak it proudly and fearless. We are Muska and it's a good day. Thank you so much. Uh, that was such a beautiful video. Um, and I just wanted to ask you um, about the community that you brought involved in your video, because I know there's a lot of children. Were those your nibblings? Yeah, those are my nibblings. And um, my sister, my older sister, she isn't shown, but she also sang with us. Um, it was really sweet. Um, and it's actually really cute because the kids um, just start singing the song randomly. <laughs> and it just brings me so much joy because we'll be in the car and they'll just start singing it. And I'm just like, yay. Oh, that's so cute. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a question for both of you, Kenyon and Ianche. How does language revival disrupt ideas about community, visibility, and status? Um, I can point out that through my journey of reconnecting to language and language revitalization that I now realize why I think the way I do in reconnecting to my indigenous language. Um, even though I still struggle and I'm relearning it, it's, I say relearning because my DNA knows it, my memory, my, my essence knows it. 
and it disrupts the narrative because just like decolonization is breaking apart and getting an understanding of what colonization is and, and what, how we've been informed, language informs us. And many of us, like California is the most linguistically dense territory this side of the Northern Hemisphere in excess of 250 language dialects in California alone. That being said, when people are taught about Native Americans, they are so poorly informed that they have the nerve to argue with me and my family and my community and archaeologists and anthropologists and other historians that also are aligned um, in learning and honoring truth and history. And they have the nerve to say, well, you Indians had wars too. And you Indians did this and that. And it's like, or you don't look Native. Gotta love that one. Were you there? Were you there with my ancestors to see what we look like? Or are you informed by a colonial narrative that claims the high cheekbones, the almond eyes, the lack of hair? What territory? You don't know anything. You're poorly informed. And you have the nerve to be so arrogant and entitled to speak of something that you have limited knowledge of. So language matters because it, it is what is informs, it, it's what informs us. And a little fun factoid. You recognize this symbol for media, live long and prosper. Did you know that Mark Okren developed the Vulcan and Klingon language? Of which, yes, it, it is his own intellectual property rights. However, he got his PhD in my ancestral language. He learned from many indigenous languages and he leaned to many. And yes, it's a fictional alien language that thousands of peoples tend to be compassionate about, but do they know about indigenous languages? It's ironic that people love to romanticize native peoples like, by using images like these of like when people want to make murals about native people and we use them, we use images of pre-contact native because it's so romantic to think about how pristine and wonderful the earth was and how in commune with nature native peoples are, but they're hunter gatherer. And then all of a sudden we disappear in the colonial narrative. And then here we pop back up occupation of Alcatraz. Here we pop back up Standing Rock uh, protest. And here we pop back up where, where colonizers like to call us drunk natives on the reservations. They like to come to conclusions about these instances, yet they forget, oh, code talkers? Oh yeah, we helped the war. We have community members that have been present and prevalent in history. And the timeline that we talk about, if I had a timeline and I talk about this, here we are, we have Homo sapiens sapiens 200,000 years, 200,000 years, and all the way over here, so 200,000 years, and then we have 100,000 years and 50,000 years where there's proof that there are people in the Americas, and then there's like the 10,000 year marker where, oh, all you natives came across the Bering Strait theory, look at, there's more studies that actually prove that that is being debunked. So calm down, quit leaning to it, quit dismissing indigenous peoples about things you don't know about. And then we talk about in 1492, we all know who sailed the ocean blue. Who did he run into? What language did they speak? Who were their neighbors? What were the name of the sacred waters? The name of their sacred mountains? It's been 530 plus years. What do we know about that? Is it easily citable? And then we have 1600s. And then we have the 1800s here in California, gold rush, $5 a head, 50 cents a scalp, legal genocide to eradicate natives. And then we have 1978, 10 years older than me. Many of you audience members, if you were born before 1978, guess what? You were born before the Native American had the right to practice religion freely. Oh, but weren't we taught that America was founded on freedom of religion and persecution? Or who? So language informs us. And as an indigenous person, I love seeing media with indigenous languages. I have to check my own colonial entitlement of wanting a translation. I have no right to it. No right at all. I can't sit here and be like, it'd be nice if you translated it for me. No, no. Be in community and hear the languages in their authentic presentation. You're not entitled to anything. If our relatives want to translate or help you, then be in community together, but you're just not entitled to it. Be present, be grounded, share songs, honor indigenous copyright. If you learn a song, recognize where it comes from. 
and whenever you choose to share it, if you are given the right to, because you're not just because you hear a song doesn't mean you have the right to sing it. But if you are given the right to share a song that someone shares with you or teaches you, be sure to recognize that protocol, that copyright, and acknowledge the lineage of it. Because that is how we are in community together. Just because it's not written and it's not copywritten format and acknowledge the colonial protocols, indigenous cultures have protocols, always have. So I want to acknowledge that layer of element in, in inside the language revitalization and cultural revitalization and, and continuity. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gideon. Um, Iacha, if you have anything to add. I feel like you said it all. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. <laughs> um, I also wonder, uh, because like you said, Kenyon and Ije, when you're relearning your language um, and it's sort of like in your DNA and then when you mm -hmm. say it, it's like beautiful. Um, I know this as well because of like trying to learn Natual from my little town in Mexico called Jalisco Mezcala. And I'm like, oh, great. I know the indigenous language there. And I'm trying to learn some words. And it's really funny how language perseveres because a lot of the words are still in our slang. Um, and it's, it's funny to me. And it's also like amazing to me how resilient it is. Um, because even though colonizers are like, no, you got to learn Spanish and you're like, okay, we'll take Spanish, but make it our own. Um, how does it feel in your body when you uh, speak your own language? Like, what was that um, feeling when you found something that was truly yours? I think for me, the first time I started singing, because I'm not a singer. I mean, I don't have a great voice, but I felt called to sing the words and it just felt right. It just came out like it was in there the whole time. I just didn't know how to access it. But once I got the key to that, you know, door, it just came spilling out and it just felt like home. And that's the name of the other video I showed. Chi Iwe is a uh, translation is our home. And I think another beautiful thing, at least with my language, Language. Um, and I feel like with most indigenous languages, um, the words, like if you translate them, it's like things that were important or are important to us. And I noticed that it's a lot of like nature, animals, home, heart, art, soul. And it's just like, it just it makes me happy because honestly, I hate English. <laughs> I hate it so much and it's so confusing in my brain. Um, but once I started learning Muscovu and I'm like, this makes sense. Like, yeah. So it just, like I said, it just felt like home to me and it, it does every time I speak it. I, I also agree. And also I, I, I wanna, I wanna uh, call, call to attention something um, that I'm working on decolonizing within myself. Um, my mother also says she's not a singer. And I think that's part of the colonial narrative that says what we capitalize off of. If someone is a good singer, they could capitalize off of that talent to become a professional or per perform. And my mother and my grandmother believe that when song, ceremony, and dancing stops, so does the earth. And so I don't believe that there is this concept of who is a singer and who is not. I believe all of us are meant to sing. Some of us may have different voices and different ways of presenting, and maybe some of us are a little, uh, some of us are shy and deeper voice, or some of us may not have all the lyrics, but we, we keep the rhythm, or some of us are meant to hold the instruments. And so there, to me, we all are and should be singers and dancers and, and beings in community. And so we may not be singers or, or sound, sound as though we feel as though we are good, but we are. And so I want to I want to point that out because my mom my mom would say that too and she might not be able to keep rhythm however um, she she taught me a prayer and um, in my mom's mother um, had some pieces of language and then of course in our efforts of reconnecting to written material of language there was a prayer that uh, aligns with some of our pagan community members because it is in my language it's pide kanama si kampateon petel kanoso Soto Kanoso, and it means earth my body, 
water my blood, air my breath, and fire my spirit. And how it feels within me, I've always wanted to make prayers or, or, or offer land acknowledgement in my language. And what I've learned about the Mutsun dialect and the Mutsun language, which is uh, South Bay area, dominantly Gilroy, Hollister, Watsonville area, um, a lot of the documented elements that are written, I don't know if this was because um, uh, the the settlers and colonizers and community members who chose to prioritize writing it or the community members who helped the cultural and language survivance, the last uh, uh, language speakers um, were prioritizing words of uh, utilization. So a lot of um, less uh, abstract words and a lot of like serious focal point words like this is this, this definition is that, or this is like, and we don't have a word for honor or we don't have a word for relatives. We have words for like grandmother, grandson, um, our person nearby nearby us, a million words for these things, but not like the, the abstract. And I've always wanted abstract words and um, I'm still learning, but what I, what I, what I, I really loved finding the word for people of this land mm. because in my prayers, I voice that one, we come together in community right now as a ma tira takawas, as people of this land, and we are coming together honoring indigenous protocol by recognizing the original Ama Piritakawas. And in our language, Ama means people. And actually there's a tribe called Ama Mutsun, meaning the people the Mutsun people. And I am Ama Mutsun, but I'm not a tribal member. Gotta love modern day copywriting and company and organization. It's so gross. Um, but Ama means people. And then Pire Tak Awas. Pire is land or earth talk location of awas all being from so earth location all from so people are earth location all from or earth, uh, soil and so when i realize how these tacons and the language works it feels right and it, it makes sense because english oh god it's a predatory language it takes from here and takes from there and it's it's a settler language that is entitled where it takes the convenient cherry picking parts is not integral to the relationship from the wisdom and knowledge that it comes from, takes the convenient parts, I after E, except after C, silent this and silent that. And so when I think about it, I'm like, I realize why I gravitate to my language. And I also celebrate others, even though I am, I was raised in a uh, white supremacist, xenophobic environment. I do puppies, puppy, puppy. Um, Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. I love puppies. Um, in a xenophobic environment where even my own informed concept of asking or being challenged by struggling of the shaping of words of other nations and other peoples and how I, in the past, would give up. And now I'm like, I'm less insecure. I don't allow my fragility to steer the conversation. I try and speak with accountability and saying, please correct me. Um, I'm open to learning. I apologize if I if I hinder or, or butcher your name. I will try. I will continue to try. Instead of me saying, oh, it's too hard. I'm going to get, you have a nickname. I'm entitled to a nickname because you're too hard. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, pointing out that fragility thing is a real thing. In white supremacist culture. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and along those lines, like, I know we have a question from Suzanne that says, I am directly related to large colonizers. How can I begin the journey of decolonizing that horrific family history, if any? Um, and I know personally, my fiance is white as well. <laughs> and um, the way that she sort of started decolonizing herself slash becoming an anti-racist person is looking at the history of like where she came from like even though she does have horrific colonizer history there is also she came from um ireland as well as uh czechoslovakia and being able to understand and reconnect uh with her paganism that way is something that you know has helped her and it's sort of also like really nice to have um somebody in common with to be like oh yeah i'm like trying to figure out my indigeneity as well and like have that relation but i'm just wondering uh, for you both is that a way to go is there another 
way to sort of like dig into that and reconstruct, especially for those who are who identify as white or don't identify as like being a part of culture, even though they do. I'm fighting at the bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, one, I have a resource on my website, Canyon Consulting, uh, decolonizing an anti-racist uh, uh, something anti-racist something of the European diaspora, DARCED, D-A-R-C-E-D. But I want to point out, as an indigenous person in my homelands, I recognize my privilege, being raised on the land of my ancestors, being raised in intertribal and traditional environments where indigenous protocol has always been followed and acknowledged, where people seek permission to be on our lands before any decision is made. I recognize my privilege, that being said, in the 21st century. So accounting for my privilege, I want to point out that I've learned so much from allies and non-Indigenous relatives who are in solidarity with Indigenous peoples who are just starting their journey. They're not the hyper-knowledgeable academics that have been studying for the past 40 years. I love those people too. I've learned so much from them. Um, the greater portion of things that I've learned from is recognizing I don't under, uh, unless I, when I travel, I don't have the lived experience of being uprooted or of many I am of many nations but I mean not as grounded as I currently am in recognizing my ancestry and that struggle of of being um far away from ancestral ties and homelands and recognizing that when we honor our ancestors and our elders and our ancestors ancestors that all of us have indigenous lineages from the land of our ancestors meaning we all can honor our, our own indigeneity and sometimes those roots of colonization and those colonial occurrences have deeply impacted our communities further back in time. Mm -hmm. the rec the, these recent wounds for some indigenous nations here in California is 250 years. And then 1492, 530 years. Of course, we have slavery 400 plus years ago. And so, but when we think about it, we have Irish and Scottish and English colonizers. We have Greece. We have all these nations of other peoples coming in colonizing and taking over and claiming that they are superior, treating peoples as subordinate and, and less than human to validate atrocious crimes. And so in that, there is a wound, a wound where our umbilical cord has been ripped from the earth and from our earth-based spiritual practices. And that wound has scars and it's painful. And we haven't been given a chance to learn or look at that. And, and that's historical and intergenerational trauma. And so we all have these alignments. It's how we walk in the world. And so the way I put it is honor truth and history. If you can learn about your own ancestry, do so. And I do understand some of us run into roadblocks and they are hard. Okay, if you run into a roadblock about your own indigeneity, then what about the place that you live? Place-based knowledge. What about the native peoples of whose land you are benefiting off of? If you are learning about indigenous protocol and you want to reconnect, ground yourself. I'm not a native who's going to say, go back to the country of your origin. Otherwise, I would be ripped to shreds because I'm a Euro mud and Chumash and dominantly I identify with my Mutsun Ohlone ancestry. I'd be ripped to shreds. I'm native passing. <laughs> um, and so with that, honoring truth and history about how we get, how we've come to be here. And so, but I, I really do want to say I've learned so much and I am honored to share space with allies and advocates of people who are in solidarity with indigenous peoples, allies, advocates, accomplices, and the biggest one, co-conspirators. So I want to invite that, that we might be a byproduct of colonial nations and colonial narratives, but the same way we are, we are, we are the byproduct of our ancestors, but we, we aren't them. We can recognize our privileges and our opportunities, and we can go forward in a good way, accounting for those privileges and opportunities, accounting for what came to be to how it is, and go forward being a good ancestor in training. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Canyon. Piacha, do you have any um, thing to add? I guess I want to reiterate, yeah, acknowledging your privileges especially if you're a white person, like be really mindful um, because at least with my experience, a lot of white folks don't, they're very delusional on how many things, like the microaggressions that they're doing, like they really don't know, like they're no clue. Um, so really, really 
maybe talk to other white folks, maybe get, tr don't like, I'm not saying like you can't ask, you know, indigenous people question, but like, if you can ask someone else who isn't more marginalized than you and, you know, you're not asking a free labor. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say acknowledge your privilege, uplift, uplift indigenous people, you know, buy from us. Don't like, that's another thing. So many people steal from us, our art, our, our practices, <sighs> like buy, you know, art from an actual indigenous person, not someone who like recreated something that they got inspired from it. Like it, it, it just blows my mind how it's just like a constant stealing, you know, <laughs> of, of our culture. So yeah, please uplift, please do your research when you're, you know, buying art, when you're buying a book, when you're taking in mainstream media, who are you supporting? Who are you supporting? Who are you giving platforms to? Like, if you have the privilege to give a platform to someone, who are you giving that privilege to? Is it another white person? Um, maybe change that. Maybe broaden your collective of who you interact with. Because a lot of white people don't have many POC or indigenous friends like we're out here <laughs> we're not scary we're not mean we are very kind actually <laughs> so yeah like just yeah main thing acknowledge your privilege uplift us i think those are the two i want to focus on thank you so much we only have about 10 minutes for the session so i just wanted to open the floor to see what other advice you would like to give anybody of like how non-natives can support slash advocate you all and or those who are like rediscovering their indigeneity like how do you help them with that process be be slow and intentional because there's many times that we get really excited with new information i myself i love media and, I, and these things i get really inspired and i really want to show it off and show these new skills or new opportunities, be responsible and integral with the knowledge that you learn. The same way, um, so I'll use a, 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 a protocol. I despise the word shaman. Why? It is one nation's word, one community's word. And thanks to Western settler colonialism of academia, it got cited in a book and then other communities went to other nations to learn from their medicine carriers, their doctors, their holistic practitioners, their ceremonial leaders, their suckers, their blowers. Their, there's words in every nation for these community members. It's not shaman. Our own community now uses this term because of colonization. Now in that, be accountable with the knowledge that you're learning and sit with it. One of our protocols is who we are in community. If let's say a big name elder community member teaches mentees and they teach the mentee a unique ceremony, like I'm gonna use my Lakota relatives uh, pipe ceremony. Pipe ceremonies are meant to be shared in ceremonial spaces. So it is okay to share cross intertribally with some occurrences. Now, if a said elder he tells a mentee that you can do this and go forward, yet that mentee goes forward and said, $50 pipe ceremony, $50. And, they, and then they say, I was taught by this big person. And everyone goes, oh my gosh, that big person's real. And we respect them. That person gets a vouch. No, protocol is, is go to that elder, go to that big person say, hi, I'm curious. Are you a mentor of this individual? And they go, yeah. And then did you know that this individual is doing this particular thing, like charging for pipe ceremonies? And they go, oh, wait, no. That type of accountability, who you are and how you show up in community is important but also just the whole cherry picking. I'm an Indian too. Oh, I love these elements, these convenient, juicy, low hanging fruit of wonder and wonderfulness, but I don't wanna carry the weight and intensity about settler colonialism. I don't wanna carry the weight and intensity of these laws and these occurrences committed against indigenous peoples. I don't know what ICWA is. I don't know what NAGPRA is. I don't know what these acronyms are, but I like to be, I, 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 I recognize I might have a great grandparent that's native. Okay, do you want a cookie? What are you doing about it? I don't, I don't wanna say this to people who are vulnerable and opening up to me, 
but it does run through my head when I start seeing some of their actions when they start cherry picking. I'm like, what are you doing about it? And so I want to point that out is be integral and hold yourself accountable and be patient in this learning process. There's going to be painful, hard hitting facts that are frustrating that you might even run into occurrences where, oh, like I'm struggling my own self. I don't do it because my community doesn't do it, but whistling at night, I still ask why, but whistling at night in many nations calls different beings. You don't know who you're calling. You don't, you're going to get hit. You're going to get hurt. You're, ca you're calling in danger. So I sit here in my own head. Why, why, why? I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. And I'm still preying on it. Like, can I, ancestors let me know because I'm asking all my relatives and each of them has a beautiful story as to why and it's it's common across other nations too so I'm still learning and I, I struggle with it and it's like okay but, but and then of course when you hear a no that's the biggest one don't go shopping for multiple natives to get your yes that's really gross when you hear a no when someone's like can you do this and then you get a no, and then you maybe go to another one. Can you do this? You get a no. I want my yes. I'm entitled to it. So check yourself. Um, and so being in solidarity, support, um, support art, um, consult with indigenous peoples of the land, empower, give opportunity, employ, um, uh, ask that community what might be needed. But don't you're not entitled to like you're not entitled to their time. So as much as I say, reach out to them. Don't be mad if you don't get a hold of them. The next step that you can do is honor truth and history. Learn about the history of the land, learn about the laws and occurrences of that state, of that territory, of that area, and learn. It's so very important because we start to realize the commonalities. I started realizing how connected I am to Norse um, pagan community members. And I'm just like, whoa, I never even thought. So I, I be integral and question the narratives. This background picture says, um, no more than 5,000 years ago did Ohlone people show up in the bay. That type of writing was by men of affluence in that workforce of academia and archaeology of the 80s. And they wrote with such pompous disregard of saying, with, instead of saying, with the information we have now, we can come to this understanding. How simple would it be to be accountable in that measure with this understanding or with the technology we have available to us or with all of the things that we've studied from, we've come to learn that we believe that 5,000 years ago, a lonely community and culture came forth. But no, we wrote that no more. So all of a sudden, like, and people are informed that nobody was here before then. And people go, well, you guys came over the Bering Strait. And it dismisses the accountability of how we've been the original stewards of the land, the original land managers, the first ecologists, the first astrologists, the first water hydrologists. Native American hunter-gatherer makes us sound like hand-in-mouth Neanderthal survivalists. Yet we've been stewarding and maintaining the land since time immemorial with our sacred obligation and responsibility of being the first stewards, accountable to all sacred living systems. Humans will always impact their environment. However, indigenous pedagogies have informed us how to do so accountably, responsibly, and integrally. So question where you learn and keep learning. Thank you so much, Canyon. Ieche, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I think the main thing is be intentional. Be intentional. Um, yeah, take it slow. There's no rush. It's so much you need to learn, right? Um, and just be, it's about being grounded, being present, um, being mindful. And it's a lot of internal work, honestly, um, to really just take it all in, um, because it's a lot of trauma, um, along with a lot of beautiful things, but they kind of come hand in hand. Um, but yeah, I'm, I really hope that everyone watching learned something today. <laughs> Thank you so much again, both of you for coming in and doing this session with me. Um, it was lovely to talk to both of you and get to know you a little bit more. And um, I just want to let everybody know, thank you for coming and witnessing this and being able to learn and hopefully share what you're learning to other people. Um, 
Up next, we have an art share by Tiff Lin called Unapologetically Asian and a few other art shares that are following after. Um, hope you stick around and thank you so much for joining us.